All right. Lap one on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-host S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? I'm happy to be here. Hell yeah. It's great. Hell yeah. Feels like it's been a while. It's been a while. I went on vacation, everyone. Good for you. Yeah, my first vacation in five years. Um, I've, I've, And I, I also may sound like I'm battling a cold because I am. Um, I, I, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like best laid plans, go to relax, come home with a cold, like those kinds of things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, oh. no, it was a damn delight. Uh, but you know what else is a damn delight is being back in the driver's seat with my best gal. Happy to be here. I couldn't be happier. Yeah. I couldn't be happier. Um, they're just, I mean, I'm trying to think of things. Um, that because, because I knew you hadn't been on vacation in a long time. And, uh, so it was, as I told you mid vacation, when you texted me about something, and yep. I sent you just a long series of texts and I was like, I'm so sorry. I've been trying to hold off on texting you because I've been trying to give you a vacation from me as well. Um, Didn't but, need um, it, Didn't it need turns it. out I had some things, uh, pent up. For example, I have a list. Oh my God, of course. <laughs> what a of, gift. Of things I wanted to talk to you about. Please. In the last two weeks. Let's of get our into lives. it. Um uh for one thing, um this is this is gonna upset you. And I don't know how it's gonna go. Okay. So I meant to bring it up last week, but then completely forgot. Um when I mentioned that I did a rearrange. Because I did some rearranging on the shelves behind me. Yeah. Um, I did a rearrange on uh, Funko Pops in my living room. And I took some of them out of the boxes for display purposes. I go away for one week <laughs> and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Wowzer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And look, I'll say it. I love it. I did a little area. I've, I've taken a photo. Um, I did a small area that's under my TV because I have like a, these little shelves and they're the perfect size for Funko Pops. And uh, I kind of set up my Jurassic Park Funkos. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, that's but cute. I just love them. They're very, I like them all out of the box together. Now, are you keeping the boxes? Well, I got, worried that i wouldn't like this so the boxes are currently in uh storage in my basement yeah because i wasn't sure um how i would feel about this but then i'm also like i wish because they come with plastic inside them you can't just easily fold it down yeah so then it's like storing these boxes now feels just overwhelming and i'm like maybe i should just get rid of it i don't know i've been it's been like this for a couple of weeks now and I enjoy it. Good I enjoy seeing them. Uh, part of the reason I liked them in the box is, well, the stability, because those things, once they knock over, the heads pop off and then you're done for. But I just also, sometimes I want to look at it and Im immediately know who it is. And sometimes you just don't. And so yeah. the, box, the box helps. And so I'm just like, I would like to keep it. But when I see those, I'm like, oh God, I'm so much joy. Um, I did end up having to take two larger Funkos out of the box uh, because I discovered that Evie peed on another shelf in the basement and destroyed the boxes of those Funkos. So I had to take those Funkos out of the box and I'll have to find out where they go. All of mine, all of my regular size ones I have in like a special plastic extra kind of thing. So if she peed, that wouldn't be a problem. But it was on the big, big ones, so there was no room, right? Uh, no package I could put them in. So I did have to throw those boxes out, and it. I was sick about it. Yeah. I didn't, because now I'm like, I don't know what to do with these. I know exactly who they are. They both happen to be Ron Weasley Funko Pops, which shouldn't be a surprise, because of all the Funkos I'm going to have from Harry Potter, it's going to be Ron Weasley, because uh, I love him. But um, taking those out because I had to, yeah. was upsetting taking yeah. them out by my choice to arrange them as i saw fit 
I didn't hate. Yeah. But again, I just have to make the next move to get rid of those boxes and just accept that I have someday I'm going to have loose Funko Pops. Right. I hate the idea, but I'm like, just what else are you going to do? Yeah. Like, just stop it, lady. Like, you can't keep everything. If you want to clear it out, you clear it out. So um, uh, I love that that's, I came in hot. I was just going to say, we're starting at a 10. So where is this going? What <laughs> what else is on this damn list? Well, I put them in order. So okay, they're not, uh, I put them in order as they happened. Okay. As they occurred. Or th just, <laughs> oh God. Um, then you get silly things like, I don't get the point of a Juliet balcony. You know what? Same. <laughs> did Same. I, did I th see these are things that maybe it's for the best. I didn't uh, interrupt your face. No, that would have been a joy. That with one that. with no context would have really br brought me a lot of joy. Yeah. You know, a Juliet yeah. balcony is just like, hey, do you want to feel the wind on your legs from this window? Like, it's like it feels right? like that's the only purpose. Yeah. There's just to me, it's like just get a regular like a, just a window. Yeah. It's just a long window. It's yeah, it's insane to me. There's just no no point. Um, uh, you'll be happy to note I was very delighted. <laughs> I was horrified, followed by delighted. Um, the other night, uh, I fell asleep fast. Like mm. I was incredibly tired for whatever reason. Um, and I fell asleep very, very fast. And I snored so loud that I woke myself up. <laughs> like I distinctly remember I closed my eyes and suddenly I was dreaming and I could hear like a chainsaw. No, no, it was me. It was just this loud, like, <clears throat> and I, I woke up and looked at the clock and went, oh my God, I've barely been asleep. Oh my God. I was just snoring like a beast. I was horrified, but now I'm just delighted about it. Well, so. I've got four words for you. Yeah. Welcome to the club. <laughs> It happens to the best of us. You oh, snore it's... yourself awake and then you're like, what am I yep. doing with my life? I guess I'm that yeah. age now. Oh, nothing makes me happier to think as someone who's had multiple sleep problems over the last like, you know, 40 years of my life. Uh, nothing makes me happier than being like snoring that much means I was deep. Yeah. And that's nice. I liked that for me. And oh, it was yeah. it was instant. And it was just that I I scared myself awake <laughs> with the. Just mm -hmm. the growl of a beast. And I uh I'm I'm just very tickled about that now. Um oh God. I'm not even gonna give this a lot of airtime. Air time. Air time. <laughs> but I will say the the nicer weather came out here. So we we kind of all of a sudden have like a spring. Seems like we're getting spring, summer like uh weather. Uh it's supposed to snow next week, so looking forward to that. Um spring weather coming out you know what that means that's right dear listeners the return of my ding dong ditchers oh no and if you think that i didn't kind of mentally snap mm -hmm. and decide because they kind of do a thing where they ring the doorbell and then they run and if we don't make any if we never even acknowledge it in any way They'll come back a couple hours later and do it again. This time, they rang the doorbell around five o'clock. Yep. I was annoyed. My oldest went tearing out of the house to run after them, and I had to keep screaming at him to come back because I'm like, you are a legal adult. You cannot chase children. That's yeah, not a thing. Yeah. You gave that up when you're now allowed booze. Sorry, it's just yep. the price you pay. Um, And so... Then, like, 8.30 at night, we're sitting, watching a show, no movie, something like that. No. And they came up, and they banged on their window. And it scared the shit out of me, because we have a very large window in our living room. And it scared the absolute shit out of me. Because all of it was just this very loud, like, bong kind of thing. And I was like, that's, uh-uh. So I get my shoes on, and I go out the back door. And while I'm back there, I can hear neighbor kids in one of the backyards laughing about how one of them just came and did that and talking about making bets on who was going to do what next to us. And so I thought, 
am I really going to stand here behind my garbage can and wait and film them so I can have video <laughs> proof of them doing this? And then I was like, you're a goddamn adult. You're in your pajamas. It's late at night. Yeah. 830 is late for me. Sure. Uh, it was very dark. So I was just like, I've had it. So yeah. at this point, I'm shaking. I'm so enraged. So I went to the house. By then, the kids had all congregated in the living room. They see me coming. They fucking bolt. So I ring the doorbell. Dad answers. He looks at me and I went, I assume because they ran the second they saw me, you know why I'm here. And he, of course, very much brushed it off as like, boys will be boys. This is a thing kids do. I've talked to them multiple times. The entire time I was standing there, the kids would come and like knock on the window in the living room while like, oh, like to make noise over me and then just run and laugh. And I was like, I'm being bullied by like a bunch of fucking 12 year olds. And I was like, guys. And I was like, I just, this is insane. I said, I understand kids do things. I understand that. But this is just getting to a disrespectful point and they're just harassing and it needs to stop. And I was like, I just can't. And I was shaking. I was so mad. I did not sleep well that night. I'll tell you because I was shaking <laughs> so mad. Have I replayed that conversation over in my head multiple times? I have. I have. But that's just naturally, uh, naturally who I am. Who is this deadbeat father? <laughs> what kind of divorce is he going through that he doesn't think he needs to parent his children? I'll say this. Uh, he he is married. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, he also was like, oh, they, you know, a bunch of kids in the neighborhood have been doing it to us. I find if you just ignore them, they stop. And I was like, we ignored them, but they did it to us off and on for nine months. They only stopped because it got cold out. And then I haven't seen them since, knock wood. It's only been like three, four days. But then yesterday, I'm in the living room. I was doing something. And then I saw a group of them congregating, kind of just outside my house, but like kind of in the middle of the street. So I'm like, uh-huh. So then, because this is what they've made me, then I was like, get my phone out. I might need to record something if I'm going to like, so I'm like standing kind of like hovering over the window waiting. And I'm just like, this, this is the crazy person they've made me. So I'm like, okay, okay. So I'm waiting for something and we have a window open. So I'm also like leaning my ear near the window so I can hear what they're saying, but they're out and it's like, a, there's a wind. So I can't hear full sentences that they're saying. But I heard one of them say, you go do that one, I'll go do this one. And the one kid's like, oh, but there's not even a car in the driveway in that one, so there's no point. And I watched them ding-dong ditch the house across the street. They didn't come to my house, but they went to that house. And I felt bad for that neighbor, but at the same time, instantly felt better because it felt like they were targeting us and us alone because I had never seen them go after anybody else. Now it turns out they're just fucking with everybody, which still enrages me but um it's it just it's it makes me feel better knowing that it's not just us but also yeah we've ignored them we've not done anything but i shouldn't have i should i shouldn't fear my doorbell going off like all millennials no. do i don't want my doorbell going off it was them banging on the window and scaring me that i was oh, that's like, too I'm, much that's like, too don't much. touch my windows can we hire some sort of like male exotic dancer to dress as a cop and instead of paying them to dance you can pay them to just like scare the kids a little you know no no please how much to keep the clothes on <laughs> yeah well, exactly i mean <laughs> look one of my children um one of his close friends the his father is a cop so i don't want to say i have an in but I do know a police officer personally. So I just feel like if you could get a police officer to go to the house and say, sure. we know what you're doing, smarten up. Right? I feel like it could, I don't know. Oh, it I've nip it. I've debated about like going to the people across the street and being like, does this happen to you often? 
because I saw kids doing this the other day. Is it also a nuisance for you? And seeing how many people on this street that I can get who are like, these kids, these kids are over the top. I've, I've debated. I don't want to go talk to people, but I've debated about like starting a campaign and seeing how many neighbors are also annoyed and then getting the police involved and being like, hey, this entire street is being bullied by a group of children. How old are these kids? Ballpark. Um, well, I know two of them personally. Um, I would say, oh, and the one they, uh, the two that I know are like 10 and 13. Too old. Well, and that's the thing. The, the one, uh, he's going to be headed to high school in a few months. Pathetic. Grow up. <laughs> Grow up, loser. It's just, it's like, I get that that's where some kids get jollies. I never did. The idea get of it. jollies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably why they bully me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, oh, right. Um, every time I watch the movie Empire Records, um, specifically like every five years, I mm -hmm. watch it more. I'm probably a yearly view on that. But every five years... Um, who I'm attracted to in that movie changes as I age. Like it's like the first viewing, it was like, it started with Mark because he was just so youthful and adorable and silly. And it was Ethan Embry and what I wouldn't have done for Ethan Embry uh, in the nineties. And even now, um, and then a few years later, I realized that kind of like the, the sweeping romance of it all. And then it was AJ. Of course. I was like, yeah, yeah, AJ, I get it. I get it. Um, there was a very, very brief moment where Lucas was like, maybe it. I remember where I that. was like, he's weird, but I like the weird that he is. Of course. But now, as a lady of a certain age, it's all Joe or it's nothing. It's Anthony LaPaglia. It 100% is. I adore that man. He took in a 13-year-old troubled boy. In real life? No. In the, like, he, oh. he took, <laughs> he took Lucas in when he was 13. According to the yeah. extended cut. Yeah. Which is also something I have a lot of questions about. I'm like, so did a single man go and adopt a 13 year old boy? Was he What's, married at the time? Like what's there's the legalities of how he took the child in. You know what I, I mean? Have a, I have so many questions about that. They never really answer. Um, yes, there was also because it's Maxwell Caulfield, there was a very brief moment of Rex Manning, but only because it was Maxwell Caulfield. And that takes me back to Greece too, um, which is better than Greece one. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> and I will die on that hill. <laughs> That's, you know, um, but uh, Rex Manning is also a real piece of shit. So, yeah, yeah, I just found that as you mature, so does your preference of Empire Record um, employee. Um, also, uh, recently learned uh, Oprah has come out and said she's never once been to a therapist. She only ever just has chats with Gail. And I'm like, Gail must be tired. <laughs> Being her therapist, like, never oh, yeah. once. It was, and also she felt almost very proud of it. And it was like, oh, I've never been to a therapist. I just talked to Gail. That's why I have Gail. And I was like, there was a whole episode on Sex in the City about like, honey, we're your friends. You need to go see someone and talk to them about it. Yep. That's when Carrie hooks up with John Bon Jovi. Excellent choice. Thank you. It is what it is. Um, and just finally, now, this is something I could Google. Why? But it just feels like, I feel like you will know the answer. Yep. Where did Jojo Siwa come from? Of now, course. I know that, like, she was a child star. Of some way, was there a TV show? I don't know. I know Blonde with the ponytail at the side, but is now making a very um, different choice and trying to like really make something, uh, trying to have a career now, which I thought she was mid-20s. She's 20. 
So yeah. still a child in my mind, but I'm just like, where did she even come from? Fun I'm fact. only asking that because I have no idea. And I do know the answer. Of course you do. Are you familiar with a little program reality show called Dance Moms? Um, I think so because I think Abby, Abby Lee Miller from one of those did something bad and I talked about it on an episode or on a Patreon. Yes. She did something so, illegal, I think. Yes. I can't remember what, but Abby Lee Miller is the woman who runs this dance school and then the, the series is kind of following the moms and the kids who go to this dance school. Now, is this show the same one that Sia got that girl from? That made it sound, that didn't sound great. Right. The girl this from is like the Anthony Lapaglia taking in a 13 year old boy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But um, the, the, the girl from the Sia videos. I, don't I know believe what her name is. I believe Madeline? Madison. Madeline Ziegler, I believe. There it is. Yeah. I believe she also came from that there it universe. Is. Yes. But JoJo Siwa was one of the kids, I believe, on that show. And then she kind of branched out and started doing her own thing. I want to say on YouTube and got wildly oh. popular with kids. And so oh, she, sure. I've seen her in LA literally like at the grocery store, but she's wildly famous with kids. And so this was a sure. few years ago now. She was getting mobbed walking around this grocery store. Um, and at the time, she also drove a car that had like a big giant decal like of her face. And it says like Jojo Siwa on it. And I was like, listen, I've I've gone into public wearing merch items with my own face on them. It's it's not that of I'm course. saying don't dim your light, Jojo. I'm not. <laughs> Please shine it as brightly as you so choose. Um, I think for me, I just see it as a safety thing where I'm like, oh, I don't, sure. I would be terrified to be going out in a car that has my face on it. Um, but you know, that's, that's just me. That's just me, I suppose. Yeah. And thank you for knowing the answer to that question. Um, I just, I mean, I've seen a lot of things cause of course she's you know, coming out with new music and trying to change her image and all of that and all the things she's more than welcome to do. Um, but I was just like, right. I've seen your face a lot uh, back when she had the, with the ponytail, but I'm like, I still have no concept because I'm just not the right age bracket mm -hmm. for that. But I also didn't realize she was still so young. Like I thought yeah. most of the time she was famous. I thought she was like late teens. I didn't realize that now she's only 20 years old. Yeah. So child. So the people going after her online, she's 20. Oh, yeah. She's a child. Let her leave her alone. Yeah. Just let her do whatever she wants to do. Um, she's not ringing people's doorbells. Leave yeah, her alone. exactly. That we know of. <laughs> so just leave her alone. Um, but yeah, if she wants to change her vibe, let her change her vibe. Let her do whatever she wants. Oh, yeah. It is what it is. But yes, I was always like, I should know you, but I just don't. But I, I'm not in her demographic, so that makes sense. I get that. Now, I have one small news item that I oh, have brought to sure. the table. Of I was going to text you about it, and then I thought, if she has heard this, this is going to go over like a lead balloon, and we'll just move on very quickly. Sure. But if you hadn't heard this, I felt like the reaction would be worth capturing on audio tape. Thank you for audio tape. You're welcome. Audio tape and on the air have both been said yep. in this, which is neither. Yep. Not even close. I like that a lot. We, we've we heard that Nev Campbell is going to be coming back to the Scream series. Uh-huh. Are they finally paying her what she's worth? Yes. Yes. Apparently. I mean, enough for her to go. Good You'd for her. You yeah. had heard that, right? I'd heard that she was in talks and that it was they were hoping it's, that. And it is happening. It is confirmed. Yes. That's, that's not the news I have. Oh. Someone else is in talks following Neve Campbell's return to the franchise. Uh-huh. And that someone is a Miss a Courtney Cox. Okay. So she's in. Okay, thank God. It says she's currently in talks to join Scream 7 following Neve Campbell's franchise return. Okay. 
Now, I love that I'm going to ask you questions you don't probably know the answer to. Yeah. Are we also still going to get the the Jenna Ortega and the the sister involved in that? I have no idea. Because they've been in the last two. And I'm just like, it's fine, but unnecessary. Right. I'm okay with sticking with classics. Well, stay tuned because... Who knows what's next? Oh, I can't wait. You know how I feel about that series. Yes. I love it so much. Yeah. I just did a bunch of just punching the air at the idea of her coming back. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Hate scary movies. Love the Scream franchise. Listen. Except for that third one. It knows what it did. Yeah. It was the Banks. It was the bangs. <laughs> on, that, on that note, she bangs. She bangs. <laughs> um, Thank you for what, that. What you drinking over there? You got something going? Oh, yeah. I'm just doing a. I'm doing a Slurpee for the evening. Beautiful. So, yeah. I got a. I got a mug of water and then just a small glass of white wine because Ooh. is the is the vacation really over yet? Maybe yes. Uh, maybe no. Um. Well, I kind of hope it is, just because I've given you all my thoughts that I've I've had over the last two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. Listen, I'm I'm back in it. I'm back in the yeah. world. We're doing our thing. And we're going to talk, of course, about the Cinnamon Brown case. I have absolutely no concept of this case, who this is, what we're talking about. But have no fear, Mona Mears. Uh, we will get you up to speed like right that. now. In March 1985, 23-year-old Linda Brown was murdered in her own home. When police arrived, both Linda's husband and her sister claimed that the murderer was Linda's 14-year-old stepdaughter, Cinnamon, who confessed to the crime after nearly overdosing on painkillers. And even though the trial ended with a conviction, the lead investigator refused to close the case because he believed that there was something strange happening in the Brown family. Who really killed Linda Brown? And what the hell was going on in that house? Christy Oxborough investigates. Yeah, look, we're bringing something different. I always like the ones that you've never heard of because then I know you're never going to know where we're going. And that's a joy for me. I like going right. on a ride. Yeah, don't we all? Yeah. Um, you also love, because uh, uh, we didn't mention it, but I'm like, I, I don't know. It's like the elephant in the room. OJ's dead. Oh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yes. Um, he comes <laughs> Listen, Allegedly. I, I said earlier, I said earlier to my boyfriend, I was like, you know, I've seen so many immediate comments on the internet about like good riddance, glad he's gone, or even just like jokes. Whereas when, when typically when somebody of note passes, yeah. if people start joking too soon, the rest of the internet comes for them saying like, someone has died, have some decorum. This yeah. was a real life. Think of the family. And I feel like this is the first death i've ever seen where no one's coming to his aid it's literally just like yeah yeah i think the internet has just collectively went like it's fine <laughs> like whatever yeah you we know, all it's, yeah look it's interesting it, you just don't hear a lot of people speaking out being like oh he was a wonderful man you know it's just yeah. uh it's just a lot of either good riddance or or jokes and uh look yeah, you know, I don't wish wish death upon anyone. Um, sure. you know, and I, I I I don't need the jokes either necessarily, but I do just think it is funny to note that this feels like the one death, the first death I've ever seen where people are like, meh. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's also like the articles that come out about him that are all like, oh, former like NHL, what or NHL. NFL, whatever, and how great he was of a player. And then they're like, oh, and oh, there was one in particular that was like, oh, and he made a real name for himself in the 90s. I'm like, for his wife? Yeah. His ex wife. You know, and, and a friend I just, of hers. I also just want to go on the record as saying this in case people want to accuse us of being glib. You know where he really lost me? The book that he wrote, If I Did It, if mm -hmm. I did do it, whatever it's called, where he outlined yeah. how he would have killed his wife and gotten away with it. At that moment, I have no respect for this man whatsoever. Yeah. I'm not saying I had a lot before that, but that's sure. the moment for me where I'm like, I'm done. I'm not going to come. I don't give a shit. 
I don't give a shit about being nice about that man. Period. No. Nicole called the cops on him nine times he, for abuse he used situations. To badly and they use her. They let it go. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing yes. happened from that. A lot of domestic violence. A mm-hmm. lot, a lot, a mm-hmm. lot. And by the way, that's proven. That's fact. It was yeah. documented. Oh, so yeah. uh yeah, I I I yeah. I'm not saying I I wish death on anyone. I'm just saying like I'm good. Yeah. And great call on if I did it. Um trying to profit off of the murder of the mother of your children. So fucking gross. So I could gross. not be happier that I believe it was her family and um the other victim I believe it was their two families who won a court battle as to how the cover of that book would look. Right. Because it was based on their family, which is why the book in very large letters, it says, I did it. And if is very, very tiny. So the book at first glance says, I did it, which I think that is the greatest shade I've ever heard of. And I could not be prouder of those families uh, for coming up with that because gross. Yeah. Again, this is the mother of your children. Oh, it's bad. You were with her for so long. Like, gross. Be like, I didn't do it. But if I did, fuck off. Oh, yeah. Again, to me, it's like he had no credibility with me. But at that point, he just lost any any ounce of kindness that I had left. Because I just think it's like, yeah, it's disgusting. Um, On a brighter note, very quickly, I was driving around L.A. the other day and I saw a sign that said Christopher Darden for judge. And I was like, I it has to be the same Christopher Darden. Um, Oh, sure. And so I was like, good for him. Good for for him. Judge. Do they really uh, if they campaign like a like a local politician, like with line sign law or sign lawns, lawn signs, sign lawns. Jesus. Sign lawns. Yeah. Well, that just makes me <laughs> makes me think of Cylons from Battlestar. Galactica. Well, sure. Yeah, I guess but he you, is campaigning. No. This is this is what I'm seeing on the campaign trail. He's running for Los Angeles County Judge seat number 130. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, again, best I best uh, of luck to him. Best of luck to him. Exactly. It's isn't it also interesting though? Not that I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second. We opened the door. Isn't it also interesting though that Marsha Clark? I want to remind you, her career was basically over because of that trial because the misogyny was so mm-hmm. rampant and it destroyed yeah. her from the inside out. But Christopher Darden, the other attorney on that trial, not only has had a consistent career ever since, but now is running to be a judge. Isn't it interesting what your gender can uh, can do for you um, in terms of certain careers? Well, most. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just she, saying. She was she was treated so poorly and so unfairly. And I if mean, you want more information about that, listen to the Marsha Clark prosecutor profile episode of our show in which I deep dive sure. just what she went through uh, in great detail in that in that uh, in that case. And also her story. I mean, her story is fascinating and uh, heartbreaking. Yes. A hundred percent. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground and we're barely even in. We're back, baby! <laughs> also, for those listening, not watching, just know that I am like, my face is like red and sunburnt. I have no makeup on and I'm wearing a sweatshirt Christy bought me <laughs> that says pickle slut. So <laughs> just imagine that Yahoo swinging her fists in the air going, we're back, baby! <laughs> uh, I honestly couldn't be happier. This is this is where you want to be. This is how we do it. You know, just you, me, and Bantor, the perfect threesome. It really I said is. what I said. I liked it. Ah. Oh, God. Well. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, well, now I'm going to get into a disclaimer. Please. That's going to change the air in the room a little bit. Of course. <laughs> but it is what it is. So. This episode will contain mentions of alcohol and substance abuse, child sexual abuse, and suicide, so trigger warning for those who need it. At 3.26 a.m. 
on March 19, 1985, police received a call about a possible homicide at 12 551 Ocean Breeze Drive in Garden Grove, California. When Officer Darrow Halligan arrived on scene, he said it was unusually quiet, especially for a homicide call. In most cases, at least one or multiple people are waiting outside the location for police, you know, frantically trying to flag an officer down. Uh, but there was no one. It was quiet. Uh, at the time, there were no streetlights, so very dark, very quiet, nothing going on. So he kind of thought maybe it was a fake call. So when the officer entered the home, he found a middle-aged man, a teenage girl, and a baby, all hysterically crying. The man told the officer, I think my wife's been shot. She's in the bedroom. I'm afraid to go look. The man then asked Halligan to go check for him. Halligan entered the bedroom, careful not to turn on the light because he didn't want to mess with any potential fingerprints. Kudos to him for that, especially in 1985. Yep. So he used his flashlight uh, to look in the room. He discovered the body of a young woman on the bed with her right arm hanging off the bed and her left arm raised to her head as though she was sleeping. There was a blanket pulled to the woman's waist. Uh, it was fairly flat, so it appears there was no sign of a struggle. There was a lot of blood on the woman's stomach, lips, and chin. And while the officer could hear a slight choking gurgle in the woman's throat, he could not find a pulse. An ambulance soon arrived. The woman was taken to the ER where they discovered uh, she had very faint life signs, Medical professionals struggled to keep the woman alive, but she was officially pronounced dead at 4.26 a.m. The victim was identified as 23-year-old Linda Marie Brown. She was described as kind, affectionate, and fun-loving. Linda had been shot twice in the abdomen with a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver, uh, which was found on the floor of Linda's bedroom. Uh, according to the autopsy, Linda bled to death. So who shot Linda? Well, to answer that question, we have to take a look at Linda's life. So Linda Marie Bailey was born August 26th, 1961. She had a twin brother, Alan, and nine other siblings. They were raised uh, by their single mother, Ethel, who struggled with alcohol abuse. Around Christmas 1980, Linda moved in with David, and since Linda's home life had been kind of bleak, she brought her 11-year-old sister Patricia, known as Patty, along with her uh, to live with uh, Linda's boyfriend David. Also living with them off and on was 10-year-old Cinnamon, who was David's daughter from a previous relationship. In early 1981, David started his own data recovery business. Basically, there was a company called RandomX Inc., which created a system or like process for retrieving data from computers that was thought to be lost or deleted. David worked as a subcontractor for RandomX for a period of time where he learned their system very well. David then took that system and kind of altered it a little bit and then claimed to have created the entire thing on his own, even though it seemed to be just the random X system with a slight alteration. But David takes this new system. He uses it as the basis for his own business, which he called data recovery. He claimed his business was so successful that he had been hired for jobs from Coca-Cola, NASA, and the Pentagon. I don't know how accurate that was, um, I do know he did help recover info um, after the MGM Grand Fire in November 1980. So since Linda was living with David at the time, she helped with the business by answering calls. And then David taught her how to use the system so she could help run the business, you know, so he could have an employee work night and day for him for free, oh, essentially, boy. you know. So at some point in the early 80s, David and Linda get married, 
And on July 20th, 1984, they welcome a daughter, Crystal Marie Brown. And almost exactly eight months later, Linda gets murdered. So we're going to look at the day, uh, according to David, uh, Linda's husband. Earlier that day, his parents, Arthur and Manuela Brown, made the 22-mile trip from Carson to spend the day with the family. The original plan was for the entire family to head to the desert for a picnic, but it started to rain, so they all just stayed home. Well, apparently, there was some friction between Manuela and Linda, because Linda was trying to get the baby on a regular sleep schedule, but Manuela believed the baby should be picked up every single time she cried. Obviously, different generations uh, raising kids differently. David sided with his mother, which upset his wife. Uh, David uh, later described Linda as irritable that evening. I'm sure Understood. That's... Yeah. So David's parents left around 9 p.m., and David and Linda proceeded to argue about the fact that David had sided with his mother. David then claimed he apologized, and Linda seemed fine. She took a shower, and they went to bed around 10 p.m. David later said that despite Linda being okay, he was still upset about it, so he had a really tough time sleeping that night. So in the middle of the night, he decided he's going to go for a drive to clear his head. He went to a Circle K convenience store where he bought a Dr. Pepper and a Hostess apple pie. Because I know when I can't sleep, my favorite thing to do is load up on caffeine. And since I felt the need to look it up, Dr. Pepper has more caffeine than regular Coca-Cola. Interesting. So, um, it has less caffeine than Diet Coke and Mountain Dew. Why does this information matter? It doesn't. But when someone says they're struggling to sleep and the first thing they do is go buy caffeine, something feels off to me. Yeah. I'm just presenting the facts. You interpret them however you'd like. Exactly. So David then takes his snacks, goes back to his car in the parking lot, and then goes back into the store and buys a bunch of comic books. He said in the moment he thought he's going to go to the beach and find a quiet place to read. Because I know when I want to read in the middle of the night, I also like to choose a place that is completely dark. Yeah. David said that he stopped at a Denny's in Newport Beach to use the bathroom, and then he went home. Apparently, he also realized that reading in the dark was a terrible idea. Yeah. So David said he was gone for about an hour. When he returned home, he found Patty, who was 17 at the time. She was in the living room holding the baby. The baby was like eight months oldish. So Patty was hysterical, and she told David that his daughter, Cinnamon, who was now 14, had tried to kill Patty. David told police that Cinnamon was angry because she didn't seem to fit in with their family, and maybe Cinnamon wouldn't have felt that way if David had actually included her in his family. Mm. Uh, when Cinnamon went to live with them in the fall of 1984, she had to share a bedroom with Patty because there was not an extra room for her. And to that I say, David, according to your income tax, you were making about $170,000 a year at that point. If there weren't enough bedrooms, buy another house. Yeah. And while I know that's easier said than done, it's a fairly easy way to make your daughter feel welcome and included. Especially when the baby and Patty both had their own rooms, which were full of top-of-the-line furniture. And then when Cinnamon moves in, she gets a cot in Patty's room. Oof. But don't worry. They found a solution better than a cot. David got a dented, rusting 14-foot trailer and parked it in the backyard, and that's where Cinnamon lived. 
Oh, God. He said uh, she would eat her meals and watch TV in the house, but she would sleep in the trailer. And while that may seem like an extreme op option, David claims it was necessary because there was conflict between Cinnamon and Linda. He said, quote, they just didn't get along. There were continual problems between them. About two weeks ago, I spoke to her mother, my first wife, Brenda, about having Cinnamon move back in with her. Ah, but we compromised and had her live in the trailer instead. Oh, boy. What a way to make your kid feel wanted. Again, yeah. Like, go back with your mother. Nah, just go live outside. Uh, according to David, Cinnamon didn't just have problems with Linda. She also had problems with Patty, her own mother, Brenda, and problems at school. He said she didn't really have friends and she wasn't doing well in class. Patty added that uh, she thought that Cinnamon was jealous of Crystal. And maybe there's truth uh, to that when Cinnamon was stuck living in a shitty old trailer with a single Cabbage Patch doll and a single teddy bear. And Crystal, again, who was just eight months old, had more than three dozen teddy bears in her room to the point the investigators got bored counting and just stopped. An eight-month-old baby. So the baby had her own room. Just move the baby in with her parents so Cinnamon can have her own space. Um, I will never not be fired up about this living situation. And again, I don't mean to uh, compare myself to <laughs> people in these episodes, but when we moved to a new house, I would put my kids to bed at eight o'clock at night and I'd drive across town and I would spend six hours in this new house before, like, because we, we got it about a week before we had to be out of our other house. And I spent that week coming here every single night, painting the bedrooms for all three of my children. I let them pick the color because I was trying to make the transition to a new house a positive thing, something they'd be very excited about. And so the fact that I was willing to come here and paint in the dark on my own, and I hated it, but the fact that I was willing to do that and that man wasn't willing to get his child a bedroom. Also, it should also... It goes, it should be noted that this was 1985. There wasn't a housing crisis like there is now. If you're making $170,000 a year, you're going to be able to get an upgrade, even if you're not even owning. Like, you know what I mean? Yes. Like it's, it's, it's not like it is now where things are insane and whatever. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, you know, built for people to um, never be able to own a house. Uh, You know, there just wasn't the same housing crisis. I just think it's important to remember yes. that, that it's like, this was a different time where, yeah, if you had a mortgage, then you just get another mortgage. Like, oh yeah, he could have easily, like even for the time being, just baby gets moved into the parents' room. Right. Here's a new bed, here's a bedroom for her. And let's just do that until we can get another house. And then we move our family to another house. He also used to brag about how much money he made. So it's like, then put that money where your mouth is yep. and make your child comfortable in their own home. What a concept. That's all I'm asking. So David said he returned home shortly after 3 a.m. to find Patty standing in the living room holding the baby. He said Patty was hysterical and claimed that Cinnamon had tried to kill her. David then checked the entire house except for the master bedroom. When asked why he didn't check there, he said he was concerned that Cinnamon had shot Linda and then turned the gun on herself. Oh, my God. And he said because he can't stand the sight of blood, he didn't want to see it. When David finally went into the bedroom, he said he only got as far as the doorway when he saw Linda lying in what he said was an unnatural position. He said he backed out of the room and called his father. After having a conversation with his father, he then called the police. Ay, ay, ay. According to Patty, after David's parents left around nine, Linda had a shower while Patty and Cinnamon watched TV. 
Linda went to bed, then got up around 10.30 to grab a soda or a pop if you're uh, in Canada or certain parts of the United States. Patty said that Linda reminded Cinnamon that she had school the following day and Cinnamon snapped at her in like a classic teen, like, I know, kind of a way, you know what right. I mean? So Linda and David then went to bed after, uh, shortly after, Patty went to bed around 11.45. When Patty first gets to her room, she claims Cinnamon followed her in and then asked Patty to show her how to use a gun. Cinnamon allegedly said she worried someone might break in. Patty said she thought nothing of it and quickly explained how to use a gun. And then Cinnamon left the room. With Cinnamon in the living room, Patty went to sleep. She said she woke up around 2.23 a.m. to the sound of a gunshot in her room. She found Cinnamon standing near her bed. Cinnamon ran from the room, and moments later, Patty heard Crystal crying. Less than a minute later, Patty heard a second gunshot, followed by a third. Patty ran and grabbed the baby. She claimed in that moment she saw someone who looked like Cinnamon walking out the back door. Patty then took the baby to her room where she sat in front of the door to try and block it. Between 3 and 3.15 a.m., Patty heard two quiet knocks on the front door, followed by the sound of a key in the door. Since Cinnamon didn't have a key to the house, Patty assumed it was David. Sure enough, David came in. Patty told him Cinnamon had a gun. Patty said David ran around the house but didn't check the master bedroom. She outright asked him to check the master bedroom. And David said he'll go check the bedroom if she goes and looks for Cinnamon outside. Patty said she came inside and David was on the phone with his father. He then hung up and called the police. So when police arrived on scene, there was no sign of cinnamon. They called her friends. No one had seen her. Police searched the backyard. They noticed a very large dog pen that had multiple dog houses in it. There were three dogs in the pen and a fourth dog in cinnamon's trailer. Uh, the officers took the dog from the trailer and put it in the pen with the other dogs, thinking that would be more comfortable for it. Um, they did that around 7 a.m., and that's when they found Cinnamon cowering in the back of the largest doghouse. Cinnamon Darlene Brown was born July 1st, 1970. Her, par her father, uh, or sorry, her parents met when they were about 15 years old, and when her mother Brenda became pregnant at 17, David and Brenda got their parents' permission to get married. The couple were married in May 1970, and Cinnamon was born six weeks later. Now, David and Patty both described Cinnamon as angry, especially towards Linda. They said she wasn't doing well in school. They also said Cinnamon had no friends, although Patty claimed that Cinnamon had a boyfriend. But Cinnamon's best friend, Krista, denies that. Both also claim, I'm just pointing out that uh, her best friend Krista, because yeah, she had friends. They said she didn't, but it turns out she actually did. Hmm. Uh, both also claimed that Cinnamon uh, had started talking about suicide in January 1985. David said, quote, I've talked to her about counseling, but she threatened to commit suicide if I forced her into counseling. When the police first found Cinnamon in the back of the doghouse, she was covered in vomit and urine, and there was a pile of vomit beside her that contained about three dozen orange capsules. Cinnamon had a piece of paper in her hand that had been rolled up and tied with a purple ribbon. Um, inside the paper was a note that read, Dear God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt her. The police asked her when she took pill the pills, and she said between 2.30 and 3. Then she immediately asked, is my dad all right? 
The police then asked how many times Cinnamon fired the gun. She quickly said three times, once in Patty's room, twice in Linda's room. When they asked about her home life, Cinnamon said, quote, Me and my father got along pretty good, but Linda said a while back she didn't want me in the house. So we moved me out to the trailer. It still didn't work. She said, if you don't leave the house by the time I wake up, I'll kill you. Cinnamon said Linda was tired of her and didn't want her around, but also added that she didn't like living with her own mother because Brenda yelled a lot and it made Cinnamon nervous. So now it's just starting to feel like this poor kid just didn't feel wanted by her family and she had no space where she felt safe. And while that is tragic and completely unfair to the child, because again, she was only 14 at the time, um, it absolutely does not excuse murder if we're assuming that Cinnamon did in fact shoot Linda. Well, since Cinnamon admitted to it, she was arrested on charges of first-degree murder. During the trial, it was mentioned that the pills Cinnamon took were a painkiller that was usually prescribed for high blood pressure. It is uncertain of how many she actually took, uh, but she claims to have consumed the pills around 3 a.m. when her blood was taken five hours later at 8.20 a.m. The toxicology came back that Cinnamon's blood had six tenths of a microgram per milliliter um, of this drug to make that sense to us who are not scientists the average level of someone to have a prescription would be anywhere from one one hundredth to three tenths meaning the amount found in cinnamon's blood was toxic and lethal and more than double what it should have been at the very most um, and if she had not thrown up the dozens of pills that she did, she most likely would have died. Mm. And while there were no fingerprints found on the murder weapon and no gunshot residue found on Cinnamon's hands, based on her confession and the fact that she tried to take her own life after it, Cinnamon was found guilty and sentenced to 27 years to life. Since she was a minor at the time, she was sent to the California Youth Authority. And if you think that that is the end of our story, you would be wrong. Because I don't know about you, but something about this whole thing feels off to me. So what are the red flags here? And do we really think that Cinnamon is guilty? We'll find out after the break. You heard the lady. Let's take a quick break, grab another drink, hit the can, and we'll be right back with more on the Cinnamon Brown episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Clap two on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing Cinnamon Brown. Before the break, Christy teased that maybe there was a little bit more to this case than what immediately meets the eye. What you got for us? Can you imagine if I was like, nope? That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's and it. And good night. And good night. <laughs> oh, put us putting out an hour episode? Oh, they'd riot. Not our I style. Not our style at all. Oh, well, I barely get through the band tour part in an hour. So, something, to me anyway, does not feel right about this family. Or specifically, David and Patty. Because they were the only people who seemed to be really pushing the idea that Cinnamon was an angry loner who was performing poorly at school. But according to teachers, Cinnamon was well-liked and didn't seem to have any problems, although they did admit that after Christmas break, her efforts at school kind of went downhill a bit. In fact, no one outside of David and Patty said anything negative about Cinnamon at all. Most people who knew her described Cinnamon Brown as a normal teenager who, if anything, was over-disciplined. Cinnamon's best friend said David grounded Cinnamon constantly over just the slightest thing. The smallest thing would happen, she'd be grounded for a week. So David and Patty also claimed that Cinnamon was suicidal. 
Patty testified during the trial that Cinnamon had mentioned taking her own life using a gun about two to three weeks before the murder. I take you back to Patty's first statement to police that shortly before the murder, Cinnamon came to Patty's room with a handgun and asked Patty to show her how to use it. Now, if Cinnamon truly did mention potential suicide just weeks earlier, why would Patty show her how to use a gun and then just go to sleep like nothing happened? Yeah. Why was there no concern that Cinnamon might use that gun to harm herself? And I know Patty was only 17 at the time, so still technically a child. But that just feels odd to me because maybe, maybe Patty was lying. Because again, Patty and David were the only ones to ever mention Cinnamon being suicidal. Just hours after Linda's murder, David told his ex-wife Brenda and his sister Susan that if police were to contact them, they should say that Cinnamon was disturbed and possibly suicidal. He said that would help with Cinnamon's insanity plea. Interesting. Linda's twin brother, Alan, said that he hadn't heard anything about Cinnamon being unstable. In fact, it was Patty who was more disturbed than anything. He said Patty had a crush on David and she was jealous of Linda, which caused a lot of friction in the marriage. David's sister Susan said the real reason that Cinnamon got stuck in the trailer in the backyard was because Patty didn't want to share a room and, quote, Patty always got her way with David. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So now it's starting to seem like David and Patty were purposely trying to make Cinnamon look guilty, like how David told police that Cinnamon and Linda bickered constantly, but... Family and friends said Cinnamon and Linda seemed to get along just fine. But there's a few things that make me question David here. According to David, he set the security alarm at his house every night without fail. The system required a key and a code to either enter or exit the house. But Cinnamon didn't have a key. So how did she leave the house after shooting Linda? Unless this was conveniently the one night David forgot to turn the alarm on. Also, according to Patty, David knocked on the front door two times before coming in. Why would he knock on his own front door? Especially when it was 3 a.m.? and reasonable to believe that everyone in the house was asleep? And the fact that he had a key to the house? Why would you knock? Also, since your 14-year-old daughter is relegated to a trailer in the backyard and wasn't given a key to your house, that means when you lock your house at night, you're essentially locking your child out of your own house. Yeah. But that, I mean, that just makes David a shitty parent. What makes him suspicious when it comes to his wife's murder? Um, well, how about the fact that when David was interviewed by police the day after the murder, he said he arrived home and found Patty holding the baby. And when he started going to the bedroom, Patty told him not to. But when they first interviewed him at the scene... He told them he checked the whole house except the bedroom because he was worried that Cinnamon had killed Linda and then killed herself, and he was scared of seeing any blood. During that second interview, David said Patty told him not to go in the bedroom, whereas Patty told police that she outright asked David to check the bedroom, and he refused to. When David admitted to finally checking the bedroom, he said he only went as far as the doorway and he saw Linda in an unnatural position. Lying on your back in bed does not feel incredibly unnatural to me. Maybe I'm the only one. But also, how did you see Linda in the dark? 
When the first officer arrived on scene 20 minutes later, he couldn't see the body until he used his flashlight. David sang he barely went in the doorway, so didn't even turn on the light. But he could see her. But if David thought something was wrong with his wife, why didn't he run to her and see if she was okay? And then why was his first move to call his father, who was a mechanic? Mm. Which I only offer because maybe if his father was a doctor, maybe I could say, okay, fine, I understand why you might have called him first. I'd still question it, but maybe. But if you think your wife is hurt, you immediately call an ambulance. But again, I think at this point, we've already proven we just don't trust David. Or at the no. very least, I don't. And I'm trying to prove why you shouldn't either, I suppose, yeah. is what I'm doing. But what about Patty? She told police that hours before the murder, Cinnamon got angry with Linda when Linda reminded her she had school the following day. However, according to the school... David had pulled both Cinnamon and Patty two weeks earlier. In February, Linda had a conference at the school to say that both Cinnamon and Patty didn't feel safe there. They claimed students were carrying weapons and selling drugs in the middle of class. The principal said that there were no signs that either girl was unhappy at the school prior to that specific meeting. David missed the meeting, uh, claiming he was too busy to attend. But the principal said he believed that David was the catalyst to all of this. Two weeks later, on March 6th, David showed up at the school and said both girls were leaving. The principal described David as extremely hostile and even said he was huffing and puffing, um, which I can only assume was David's attempt at appearing like a big, strong man. Uh, David told the school that Patty would be moving to Nebraska and Cinnamon would be going to her previous high school in Anaheim. David then hired a private tutor for Patty, but not one for Cinnamon. And clearly, Patty didn't go to Nebraska and Cinnamon didn't go to Anaheim. So I don't know what David's plan was for Cinnamon's education, but she wasn't attending school at the time of Linda's death. So it wouldn't make sense for Linda to remind Cinnamon that she had to go to school the following day, as Patty had suggested. And if Patty and David don't seem suspicious enough, test indicated that no sign of gunshot residue was found on Cinnamon's hands. Her defense team said the test results did not come back before the trial, so they weren't able to use that to disprove Cinnamon's confession. However, the GSR tests on David and Patty both came back as positive, which is weird because they claimed they hadn't touched a gun in well over a year. And when police told David they were going to question Patty for a second time, David told them not to because he was really concerned about Patty's grief, which um, doesn't seem believable for a man who only seems to think of himself. Speaking of which, um, it turns out that David had multiple life insurance policies on Linda. In fact, he took out four policies in a year before Linda's death and those policies total about $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. Again, this is 1985. Yeah. Uh, David, of course, was the sole beneficiary. David said the reason he insured his wife for so much was because Linda was integral to his business. And if something were to happen to her, oh, he'd have to find several people who could replace her. But he'd, quote, never find anyone as brilliant. And I'm not denying Linda's intelligence or her ability in David's computer business, but insuring your wife for $1.2 million feels suspicious. That amount is equivalent to about $3.4 million in 2024. 
So we're all sufficiently suspicious of this man, right? Because to quote Blanche's beloved late night host, Seth Meyers, it's time for a closer look. Fantastic. (laughs) Shout out to Seth Meyers. So David Arnold Brown was born November 16th, 1952 in Phoenix, Arizona. He was the sixth of eight children born to Arthur and Manuela Brown. Uh, David later said he didn't love his mother. He described her as selfish, controlling, greedy, and violent. (laughs) It's interesting that he openly says he didn't love his mother, and yet he chose to take her side in a disagreement of how his wife was raising her his daughter yeah so interesting so the brown family moved to california in 1960 david told some people that his childhood was great he told others it was a horror show uh including claims he was beaten by gang members and molested by a man in a park we don't know he told some people that happened some people it never happened so we have no idea if it happened or not when david was 11 years old he claims he was running a gas station for 16 hours a day which i don't believe who who would let an 11 year old no run a store like get out around the age of 14 david dropped out of school partway through the 8th grade and ran away from home At 15, he met Brenda Kurges, who was a friend of David's sister, Susan. When Brenda became pregnant two years later, the couple got permission from their parents to get married. David and Brenda were married in May 1970, and Cinnamon was born six weeks later. According to Brenda, the labor lasted two days, but David wasn't there because he couldn't handle the sight of blood or the sounds of pain. Mm -hmm. David and Brenda struggled financially, so David got his GED and then took a computer program through the welfare department. The program eventually led to David starting his own computer data company in 1981, Uh, but I'm less interested in his work and far more interested in his personal life. Oh, God, we're not going to like this. So... Brenda said that David physically abused her once in the first year of their marriage. She said David's father threatened to beat David if it were to ever happen again. So he never laid a hand on her after that. But David was also incredibly controlling. When they got married, Brenda didn't have her driver's license. And when she mentioned learning to drive, David said no. When David learned that Brenda got her license behind his back, he was furious. She thought she'd done some such a great thing and he'd be excited, and uh, he was not. But you know what, Brenda? It was your own right. Of course. To do whatever the heck you want to do. So good for you for doing it anyway. Uh, but to be clear, I said she went behind his back. I wasn't meaning in a negative way. She's within her right to do what she wanted to do. Um, I just mean David didn't know about it. Yes. And then once he found out, he was pissed. And I mean, these are his issues, uh, Brenda, not yours. So David and Brenda divorced after three years of marriage because according to Brenda, David was, quote, consumed by women. She said, and I quote, he was oversexed always leaning out of the car or turning around to look at women, he was obsessed. It didn't matter if they were young or old. Brenda said they were having sex three times a day, but that was still not enough for him. He then told Brenda they got married too young, and he didn't feel like he had enough sexual experience under his belt. So he very boldly asked for Brenda's permission to go out with a co-worker named Lori. He said Lori is older, so she could, you know, teach him things that Brenda couldn't. Brenda agreed, and soon David started taking a lot of overnight camping trips, 
which he claimed were with a with a male friend, but he was really with Lori. So it's wild to ask for permission to cheat, get told yes, but then still feel the need to lie and go behind her back about it. It's also wild that he outright asked to have an affair, but also asked, also told Brenda she wasn't allowed to have any male friends. She also wasn't allowed to speak to a man unless David was present. Wow. So, you know, just a complete controlling jackass. So when David and Brenda officially separated in early 1974, David said it was because Brenda cheated on him. He also claimed she was psychologically abusive towards him. We don't buy any of that. Uh, the couple soon reunited, but separated again when Brenda caught David with Lori less than a week after they reunited. David said, quote, the divorce really tore me up. And he said he was lucky to have Lori because she comforted him when he found out Brenda was cheating. Again, the only cheating in that marriage did not involve Brenda. David and Lori got married in October 1974. David was 22. Lori was 19. And this, dear people, is the time I will not harp about a man marrying a 19-year-old. Uh, he was 22. I'll, I'll, sure, I'll let it go. I will let it go this time. They divorced four years later mm -hmm. in October 1978. But during their marriage... They lived down the street from the Bailey family. Ethel Bailey was raising 11 children on her own, and she suffered from alcohol abuse. David worried about the kids at the house, so he would often stop by and bring the children food. After his divorce from Lori, David told Ethel he was suffering from colon cancer, and he only had six months left to live. He said that since his marriage had ended, he needed a lot more help around the house, so he asked Ethel if he could hire a few of her daughters, who were like between the ages of 9 and 13. He wanted to hire them to clean his house. Ethel later said, how do you say no to a dying man? Well, what Ethel didn't realize is he wasn't having the girls clean his house. Instead, he was teaching them to steal small items from stores and tools out of the back of people's trucks. I'm just convinced he was never a good person. Um, and before you think I'm being too harsh um, and, you know, saying things out loud, I maybe shouldn't. Um, one of the daughters that was, you know, coming over to apparently clean his house was Linda, who would be his future wife. She was 13 mm. when they met. But don't worry, David said they didn't officially start dating until Linda was 15. David was 24. Here we go. At the time. A 24-year-old taking advantage of a 15-year-old is not dating, David. It's illegal. Um, but to quote David's first wife, Brenda, quote, David likes them young. Barf. Barf. But Linda must have been like good luck or something because miraculously David's cancer was gone just like mm. that. Mm. To be clear, it never existed in yeah. the first place. Um, once Ethel realized that there was something happening between Linda and David, she let them both know she absolutely did not approve so Linda moved in with her older brother for two years, and when she was 17, she begged her mother to finally let her marry David. Ethel agreed, and David and Linda were married in Vegas in June 1979, when David was 26 and Linda 17. Oof. David and Linda lived together for less than two months before separating in August 1979, a month later, David filed for divorce, claiming that Linda was too immature. Maybe because she was a child? I don't know. 
<laughs> Just a thought, you ass hat. Yeah. Mm. David later claimed it was also because Linda was heavily into drugs or alcohol. One of the two. Ah, he couldn't remember which. I'm sorry. But if your loved one is heavily into one or the other, you will absolutely remember which one it is. Yes. So, in May 1980, David married a woman named Cindy. They were co-workers at Memorex, where David was the manager. <laughs> so I guess when I say co-workers, I really mean David was Cindy's boss. Of course. They separated seven months later on Christmas Eve. The following day, you know, Christmas Day, Linda moved back in. David later admitted that throughout his marriage to Cindy, he never fully stopped seeing Linda. Mm -hmm. So just such a piece of shit to almost every woman he comes into contact with. David and Cindy officially divorced in January 1981. And at some point after that, David and Linda remarried. When Linda moved back in in December 1980, she brought her sister Patty with her. Patty was 11 at the time. Patty later testified in court that David started molesting her shortly after she moved in. Mm. She said he told her, um, and I apologize in advance, this is probably one of the most vile things I'll ever say. According to Patty, uh, she said David told her that him touching her would actually help her develop into a proper lady oh my god yeah patty said they started having sex when she was 15 to be clear that's actual assault yep and not uh consensual sex because at the time david was 31 prior to moving in patty uh had been molested by one of her brothers so when david started doing the same thing to her she thought this is just how it goes. Mm -hmm. So, I know. Oh, God. So, on July 1st, 1986, just 15 months after Linda's murder, David and Patty were married. No! No! According to Patty, David told her he was dying. And he wanted to ensure that Crystal would be taken care of. This guy is diabolical. But David denied that the marriage was ever legal. He said, quote, Patty and I both deliberately lied on the application. We only got married as a favor to a friend of Patty's who was pregnant. I never intended to marry Patty. I mean, getting married as a favor to a friend is... Not a thing. No. But also the wedding certificate and the prenup that they signed, we're all fully legal documents. But David told Patty to burn the papers because he was convinced they needed to hide their relationship. David said, quote, it couldn't be common law marriage either because Patty was my dependent, not my wife. So even if she lived with me all the time, it wasn't like she was a wife. But she was legally your wife. Anyhow. Yeah, Jesus. Then on September 29th, 1987, Patty gave birth to Heather Nicole. She told David that a doctor told her she'd never be able to get pregnant, so they just never bothered with birth control. David made Patty pay her own hospital bill and refused to claim Heather as his own. Wonderful. Although... He did try and get multiple life insurance policies on the baby worth several hundred thousand dollars. But weirdly enough, no one would insure a newborn for that much money. So that didn't exactly work out for him. That's terrifying. Mm -hmm. But we're going to call it like it is. David's fucking gross. Yeah. I mean, he was in his 20s when he first became interested in Linda Bailey. When she was 13. Then, after Linda's death, he started a relationship with Linda's sister, even though he continuously denied it. And from the sounds of it, the relationship started long before 
Linda's death. David is terrible to women, a full-on predator, and an outright liar. Um, for some other examples of the way this man is garbage, I give to you, David Brown is absolute trash. Side note. Beautiful. We're going to start small. When a neighbor accidentally hit the gas pedal instead of the brake of her car, her car went careening into David's living room. Before calling the police, David quickly moved his desk and computer into the room and tossed them around to look like they'd been destroyed in the accident. So great news. Um, because of that quick thinking, he got to upgrade his old Commodore computer to a classy new IBM for free. Uh, shout out to the Commodore 64 and the fact that I never once survived that Oregon Trail. Not even close. But continuing with the side note, immediately following Linda's funeral, David purchased a sports car, or more specifically a 1985 Nissan 300ZX Turbo complete with vanity plate that read data wreck for his uh, business data recovery, of course. Of course. M months later, coincidentally, on my fourth birthday, huh, David and Patty got into an accident in that very sports car. They were stopped at a traffic light when the car behind them slipped off the pedal and bumped into the back of their car. There were maybe like the tiniest of scratches on the car but it was such a low speed incident that no one was hurt because they were all pretty much stopped at the light it's just slip the foot off go ahead and bump into it um david claimed severe whiplash and got over sixty thousand dollars from the insurance company over it there is also the fact that one time david ordered cinnamon to stand in front of the family in her underwear while he spanked her with a leather belt. Jesus. A doctor later reported David to the authorities about this incident. Uh, it appears as though nothing was done. So David is a predator. He marries his wife's younger sister, although he publicly denied it. He also didn't tell Cinnamon that he got married. But she said there was something up between her father and Patty. Apparently once, months before Linda's death, the family all went to Kmart together. The baby, Crystal, needed a diaper change, so Linda changed the baby in the car while David, Cinnamon, and Patty went inside. After browsing the music section, as all teens are wont to do, Cinnamon then went around the store looking for her father and she found him making out with Patty in the corner of a store. So she knew something was up long before. But while Cinnamon is incarcerated, David would come to visit her often. And when he would come to visit, she would ask about Patty. And at one point, David lied and said that Patty had moved out. The truth, of course, was he and Patty had gotten married and she'd given birth to his baby, although David refused to admit that baby was his. When Cinnamon learned the truth, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. She confronted David. Uh, he said he hadn't been with a woman since Linda. He said he just didn't know if he'd ever be able to trust a woman again. <laughs> As though him trusting a woman is the trust issue in yeah. uh, literally any of his relationships. But, thankfully, Cinnamon absolutely saw through that bullshit, and in July 1988, after spending three years in the California Youth Authority, Cinnamon Brown contacted Jay Newell, the district attorney investigator who worked her case. She told him, that while she knew about the plot to kill Linda, she was not actually involved. Cinnamon said that David told her that Linda and her twin brother Alan were involved with the mob and planning to kill David to take over his business. So David, 
told Cinnamon for his safety they needed to get rid of Linda. Oh, wow. According to Cinnamon, David told his daughter she needed to confess to the crime because she was so young she wouldn't be punished. Cinnamon said that David first mentioned Linda's potential murder about seven months before it happened. Cinnamon suggested David just get a divorce. But David said Linda would still try to kill him. Oh, so his only solution now would be to abandon the family entirely and just go start over somewhere else by himself. But when Cinnamon said she didn't want her father to leave, he said, well, then the only option is for Linda to die first. The entire thing was planned by David, who also taught Cinnamon how to write a suicide note and even had her write multiple drafts to make sure she could do it correctly. And then he would either burn them or flush them down the toilet. Jesus. David then suggested that Cinnamon try and shoot herself in the head after, but not like to kill herself, just to just graze yourself so it looks like you tried. Because 14-year-olds with zero gun experience would be great at something like, you know, aiming. When Cinnamon seemed uncertain about that idea, David gave her three bottles of pills and told her she needed to take them all after the crime was committed. David asked Cinnamon repeatedly if she loved him. And when she said yes, he said, quote, I want to make sure that you love me enough that you'll do anything for me. If you love me, you'll trust me. I'm your father. I know what's best. And then he just kept telling her, if you love me, you'll do this for me. Wow. I mean, such a piece of shit. Yeah, for real. So, Cinnamon, you know, she's had some years in prison to think about it. She realizes she was manipulated this entire time. So she agreed to wear a wire to catch David in his lies. Oh, hell yes. And on the very first visit, when she was wired, Cinnamon says hello to her father. He responds, what? No, I love you? Pretty strong out the gate, Dave. Pretty also, strong. So are we greeting people with I love you? I no, love you. That's not a thing. A, it's not a thing. No, no, it's not a hello, thing Hello, I love you. Like, what? Yeah, it's, it's wild and kind of shows, you know... Uh, his expectations of the women in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, so Cinnamon then admitted to David she felt manipulated and she said she wanted to tell the truth about what happened to Linda. David told her Linda was heavily into cocaine and that she was working with the mob. Neither of those statements were true. David then said that uh, if it made Cinnamon feel better, he'd have Patty confess so she could take her place. When Cinnamon asked why she couldn't just tell the truth, David said, well, we all have no prior knowledge of the crime, so we'd all go to jail. And by we, he meant Patty and his parents. A direct quote from The Wire do you see any reason for five people's lives to be ruined, for all of us to go to jail because we knew what was going to happen beforehand? I can't survive in jail. I would kill myself before I'd let myself die a slow and painful death in a cell. Now, that's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. To, to tell your teenage mother that her ruining her life was worth sparing other people is insane mm -hmm. also and and i'm really really gonna hammer about this but did david's parents know about the crime beforehand is that why david called his father before he called the police i i mean i just for no for everything I've seen about this case, nothing ever really is mentioned about David's parents knowing about the crime, but him saying the five of us? I mean, 
did you really tell your parents? I, I can't let that go. Yeah. But during another visit, while she still wore the wire, David brought Patty with him this time. And Patty told Cinnamon that she would confess so she could go to prison and Cinnamon could be released. Cinnamon then questioned them about their relationship, and David said there was absolutely nothing physical between him and Patty, you know, his legal wife. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon then said, well, good, because that's incest. Patty said, what's incest? And David said, oh, a lot of parents kiss their kids on the mouth. One, no, they don't. Two, you're not her parent. So, also not a great look. No. So, but we know that David is a lying piece of shit, especially because he doubled down and claimed that Linda actually might have poisoned him before her death because a month or two after Linda died, David claimed he went through just liver failure. No, he didn't. No. No, he absolutely didn't. After uh, Cinnamon got multiple conversations on tape, police were able to get enough evidence to arrest both David Brown and Patty Bailey Brown on September 22nd, 1988, for the murder of Linda Brown. When he was first taken into custody, David denied any knowledge of his wife's murder. Then he changed his story and said he was scared of Patty because he believed Patty killed Linda because he thought Patty might be, you know, a bit obsessed with him. Then police admitted that Cinnamon had recorded their conversations, uh, and he finally admitted he did ask the girls to kill his wife, but he didn't think they'd actually go through with it because he was totally joking. (laughs) Mm. David then had his lawyer send a letter uh, in June 1989, um, to the press saying that, you know, David was innocent. The letter referred to David as, quote, prominent individual millionaire entrepreneur, Mr. David Brown. Um, it claimed he was being tried unjustly. Now, if you're going to send a letter to the press, I mean, who would you send it to? I mean, this letter got sent to newspapers, magazines, talk shows. We're talking 60 Minutes, the LA Times, Newsweek, Lifetime, People, Oprah, Donahue, Geraldo, and, you know, Playboy and Penthouse. Jesus. <laughs> it's just, you can't write this guy as a character, you know no, what I mean? Like, no piece. Anyhow. But David wasn't foolish enough to think a simple letter is going to save him. So while in jail awaiting trial, David hired a fellow inmate named Richard Steinhardt to kill the district attorney, Jeffrey Robinson, investigator Jay Newell, and of course, Patty. Oh my God. David believed that if they were to die, he would would then insist on a speedy trial And without their lead attorney and two witnesses, oh, the prosecution just wouldn't stand a chance. Yeah, it's not like they have you on tape, you know, confessing to anything, you dumb shit. Idiot. So David offered Steinhardt half a million dollars to arrange the three murders. However, uh, David didn't count on the fact that Steinhardt told the police about the situation immediately and willingly recorded some of the conversations with David. Of course! One part of the recording uh, included David asking if Patty's death would be self-inflicted. Steinhardt said, no, I think she's going to back up on a knife. And David responded with, quote, okay, that's good. That's what I want. This guy's a psychopath. Oh, yeah. It's amazing to me that David wouldn't be more hesitant when talking around people after his own daughter recorded him. Yeah. Uh, But honestly, I'm glad he got caught. And not just for all the bullshit he pulled, 
because also when he was deciding how many hits he was going to order from prison, um, he did so as casually as one would decide how many nugs you're getting at a drive through because he briefly considered having Steinhardt kill his first wife, Brenda. I mean, why order three hits when you can order four? You know what I mean? Jesus, yeah. Uh, but why Brenda? Uh, because David was angry at her for having a baby with another man after their divorce. Apparently, it's totally cool after their divorce that David got married five more times and had two more children, but it enraged him that his first wife moved on. To be clear, I really only added that extra small bit uh, for the sake of uh, Lauren's profile building. Thank you. Mm. So at David's trial, uh, both Cinnamon and Patty testified against him. They admitted David woke them after midnight on March 19th, 1985, and told them, girls, it has to be done tonight. Cinnamon claimed David handed her the gun and told her to use a pillow as a silencer. He said he was going to drive around, go to a store where he would ensure the clerk would remember him so he could have a strong alibi. Which, you know, absolutely explains why he would go into a store, buy something, leave, and go immediately back into the store Yeah, to buy something else. So, I mean, that would make you memorable. Uh, Patty testified to the sexual abuse that she suffered at the hands of David, saying she had been in love with him since she was a child. According to Patty, when she was just 11, David told her he would marry her someday. When asked why Patty would go along with a scheme to kill her sister, she said, quote, I loved Linda, but I loved David more. Oh, God. Then in yet another twist in the case, Cinnamon admitted she was the one who fired the gun that night. This is wild. And look, I don't get how this is possible because there was no gunshot residue on her hands right uh, but now she's saying she was the shooter uh, so i guess i'm just taking her word for it but the pillow that david told her to use as a silencer got caught on the gun so she ran to patty because she thought she broke the gun and patty had to like take a look at it and while they were in patty's room the gun accidentally went off while the girls were looking at it thank god Nobody got hurt in that moment, but then they heard Linda crying and Patty handed the gun back to Cinnamon and told her to go finish it. Oof. Cinnamon said she was ashamed of herself for loving her father enough to kill Linda. David told his daughter that she was young enough if she claimed to be suicidal, they'd just send her to a psychiatrist and then send her home. And whether he truly believed that or not, we know that's not how it happened as Cinnamon was convicted and sentenced to a youth facility. And some may argue that David truly did believe Cinnamon wouldn't be found guilty, but I'm going so far as to say he did not care. No. What would happen to his daughter? After using guilt trips and scare tactics to try and make his daughter kill her stepmother, David then suggested Cinnamon shoot herself in the head. When she said no, he told her to consume dozens of pills Oof. i remind you she consumed so many if she had not thrown up she would have died again that man did not care about anyone but, but himself yes when asked why cinnamon went through with it she said quote why would he tell me something that wasn't all right again she was just 14 at the time of the murder and no her age does not excuse the crime as the shooter, she should do time, which she did. But she wasn't the only one who should have been held responsible. The judge called David a master manipulator, an all-around scary person, and he then compared David to Charles Manson. Which I, Dave, I was Dave, just thinking the same thing. Well, and David was very offended by that comparison. David Brown was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Days later, David pleaded guilty to charges that he conspired to have three people, including his wife Patty, murdered, 
he was sentenced to another six years. Uh, since Patty was a minor at the time of Linda's murder, she was charged in juvenile court in May 1989. She pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. She was sentenced to the California Youth Authority, where she would stay until she turned 25. At the time of sentencing, Patty was 21. Cinnamon Brown was paroled in February 1992 after serving seven years. During that time, she earned her high school diploma. She completed an associate arts degree. Cinnamon was 21 at the time of her release. Since then, she has lived a private life out of the public eye. I read that she eventually married a corrections officer that she met while incarcerated. I could not verify that for sure. I just... I hope that she's happy and healthy. Yes. After all she's been through. Uh, David and Linda's daughter, Crystal, went to live with David's parents, which make me think back to the tapes where David suggested his parents knew about Linda's murder in advance. Yeah. I hope they didn't. I I also hope that Crystal, uh, as well as David and Patty's daughter, Heather, spent their childhoods in loving, supportive homes. David Brown died of natural causes in prison in March 2014. He was 61 at the time. Before his death, David did an interview with true crime author Anne Rule, who wrote a book about this case, uh, which I read, called If You Really Loved Me. The book was later made into a miniseries called Love, Lies, and Murder, starring Clancy Brown, Moira Kelly, and Cynthia Nixon. Huh. But in that interview with Anne Rule, David made a lot of outrageous claims. Uh, first, he said his first marriage to Cinnamon's mother, Brenda, really, really tore him up. Um, but he took pleasure in knowing that Brenda spent her life regretting losing him. I just highly doubt that Brenda regretted losing you at all. Um I mean, this dude claims he was faithful to every wife he's had um, and that they were the ones who cheated on him, which, uh, nope, from the looks of it, that's not how that happened. No. Uh, then he claimed that Patty and Linda's mother, Ethel, tried to sell her daughters to him. Uh, he also said, and I quote, Cinnamon was a violent and abusive teenager Patty was unstable. She tended to like a lot of guys. I felt Patty was a little bit infatuated with me. You married her. Mm. Yeah. David then finally admitted to having sexual encounters with Patty. Because remember, for so long, he was like, nope, we never did a single thing. Now he's finally admitting it. Then he said, quote, she wasn't unattractive, but trust me. She couldn't have gotten pregnant with the kind of encounter we had. To quote a sitcom that I have been waiting all episode to quote. Ew, David. Yeah. Yeah. But he claimed he didn't feel anything for Patty. Also, to be clear, he said uh, she wasn't unattractive. She was almost identical to Linda, FYI. Like, they're... Uh, there's going to be pictures on our socials. Those girls were very similar visually. So if you're attracted to one, most likely you were attracted to the other. So yeah. get out of town, sir. But he claimed he didn't feel anything for Patty. In fact, he said in the interview, he outright hated Patty. And that up until his arrest, he was actually dating a 19 year old named Betsy. So I guess he was just, back to trusting women then because i seem to recall david telling cinnamon he hadn't been with a woman since linda's death because he couldn't trust women anymore mm -hmm. i also find it interesting that david refuses to admit any feelings for patty and he even outright said he hated her and yet while incarcerated david sent letters to patty every single day mm-hmm he never sent a single letter to his daughter, Cinnamon. Again, full piece of shit. And I hope he rots for what he's done to the women in his life. 
Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough. What a wild ride. <laughs> that yeah. was a roller coaster. Oh my God. Um, all right, look, let's take another break, grab another drink, hit the can one more time, and we're gonna be back with our final thoughts and feelings on the cinnamon brown case on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Right, clap three on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the Cinnamon Brown case. What a wild ride. This one really <laughs> took turns I did not see coming. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, all right, I'm going to jump all around here. Um, here's what's interesting. The first thing I'm going to get to out of the gate, and I know you're thinking, that's the thing? The detail about whether or not his parents knew about the crime. I'm of two minds about it. One... Oh. I don't, it would not surprise me if he did fill them in on it because his first phone call after her death was to his father. That does right. seem to track that it's like, hey, I did that thing we talked about. Here's the one thing I will say. I did feel like ultimately if he didn't tell his parents, even if he did, Either way, I think he was just using that detail as a way to manipulate Cinnamon further. Oh, sure. Right? Feasibly, it's possible that she could have had some kind of relationship with her grandparents, um, even if it wasn't a great relationship. I think it's an obvious manipulation tactic to say, like, look at grandma and grandpa. They're, they're going up there in years. Do you want to put your grandmother and grandfather in prison? Oh, sure. Like, if yeah, that's what, that. what stuck out to me immediately when he said, like, well, you know, you do, do you want to put five people in jail? I could just see, hear his next words being like, you think grandma and grandpa would survive in prison at age 60 or 70 or whatever they were at the time? Like, that just felt like an overt, easy way to continue to manipulate her to sure. me. Do I think that she pulled the trigger? I don't. I'm going to go, I'm just going to say from the beginning here, the science doesn't lie. Yeah. Right? So the fact that there was gunshot residue on Patty and David's hands, not on Cinnamon's hands, the fact that there was no prints on the gun, I mean, again, whoever it was was being clever there. But look, do I want to say that David did it? I do. Do I think that that's true? I don't know. I think... It's more than possible that Patty did it. I mean, the statement, I loved my sister, but I loved David more. That's a pretty bold thing to say. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, like he had been grooming her since she was 11 years old. Oh, 100%. I do not blame her for, I do not blame her for the feelings in that way. Oh, It's sure. more just like in terms of, in terms of like using it as the defense to your not murdering or murdering your sister. It, it, I feel like most people would say like, oh, of course I loved my sister. Like I never wanted her dead, like guilty or, or innocent. I feel like that would be typically your, the standpoint someone would take. So, so to say like, well, yeah, I loved her, but I loved him more to me. It's just like, oh, maybe you did do it then. And the fact that Patty did say later to Cinnamon, like, I'll turn myself in, I'll say I did it and get you out of prison. Was she just doing that to be nice? She had a child at that point. Yeah. To me, that just smells of I'm actually guilty. Allegedly, of course, I'm speculating here. Um, the whole ruse about, well... You know, we have to kill Linda because she and her brother are working with the mob and they're coming for me and I have to have uh -huh. her killed. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to make sure I have a good alibi and I'm going to go into the store and come out and go into the store so I'm memorable. Like, all of this is just... And then the fact that he was having these young girls carry out this crime for him because he told them to and had been manipulating and, and grooming them for some time. Yeah, in my mind the whole time, I was like, oh, this is Charles Manson 2.0. So when the, the you said the judge said that, it's like, yeah. Absolutely. And this guy thinks that he's smarter than everybody. He thinks that yeah. he's going to get away with it. He thinks, you know, 
the idea that he would try and take out four hits while in prison, the <sighs> fact that he would trust this other inmate is all just speaks to his own narcissism, his own like personality disorder, because most people wouldn't be that bold. Sure. Right. And again, it's like, why did Brenda, what did Brenda do? What did Patty do? Why do you need to kill, have them killed? Oh, it's, I'm fascinated by the idea of like, okay, so I was caught because someone I know and trust had like a, had a wire. Right. Oh, I could probably trust this guy. I don't know. It's so stupid. I just feel like I would be paranoid about everybody recording everything after that personally. But I am fascinated by him being like, okay, you know who's going to die? The main lawyer, the investigator who's going to figure all this out, and my wife. I, I can't believe Cinnamon wasn't on that list. Yeah. The fact that it's like he ov he obviously, regardless as to what he said, had very deep feelings for Patty in some way. I mean, for the love of God, he married her and then sent her letter after letter. Um, but yeah, I'm convinced. I can't believe he wasn't like, well, kill the person who's going to testify against me who recorded it. It's almost yeah. like that's where he drew the line was like, no, I can't kill my own child. Well, yeah, because, I mean, again, the fact that he described, he said he hated Patty, this, like, really profile-wise is interesting because it does feel like it could also be motivated by, is she talking to other men? Are other men talking to her? If no, if I can't have her, no one else can. Oh, sure. Right? Which is, again, yep. connects to Brenda and how he treated her, that he wanted to be able to have all these relationships with other women. She wasn't even allowed to talk to a man if he wasn't present. Like, the, the, the deep hatred of women, it sounds to me, well, first of all, again, he said he didn't like his mother and uh, had all these comments about his mother. We may be looking at the source of, of this misogyny for him and, and hatred. Um, but it's interesting as it almost feels like this is, look, go with me on this. I, yeah. I'm going out on a limb. Oh, I can't wait. The fact that he wanted nothing to do with his daughter, Heather. The fact that he was able to kill Linda when they had an infant child. The fact that he kept Cinnamon in the yard, in the trailer. He's willing to mistreat his offspring or want nothing to do with them, to be ambivalent but he he hates women so it almost feels like it's this weird internal battle for him where if it's just a woman that he's had a child with he doesn't give a shit about her because he hates women sure but with the kids it's like it's like he's he's grappling with his hatred of women but then it is his child so it's either i keep her in in a shitty trailer in the backyard because i don't give a fuck about her or it's like, I don't want anything to do with that child. She's not mine. I don't care. Sure. All of it, in my opinion, is, of course, a fear of intimacy, a fear of vulnerability. He doesn't think that he can get close to women. So he mm -hmm. has to. So he hates the women that he's in relationships with. And then he has this these conflicted, confusing feelings, I think, about his female children. I would be very curious how he would have treated a son. Oh, yeah. I'm also fascinated that he had three daughters. Although, again, he never admitted to Patty's uh, child. But when Cinnamon was asked, or Cinnamon was told, oh, hey, just so you know, they got married. And by the way, Patty had a had his child and then she asked her father about it and was like well what about patty having a kid and he was like oh absolutely not mine it's some like skeezy boy down the street who knocked her up and cinnamon then told the investigator she was talking to she was like 
My father was so possessive, he never would have let Patty talk to another boy, let alone be around one enough to get her knocked up. So she's like, there's just no chance that that's not his baby. And he, of course. he very much was like, I'll take a blood test. I don't know why. And I'm like, was one ever done? Probably I not. I fully believe that absolutely was his baby. Of course. Listen, he's grandstanding. He's trying to get, he's trying to take out hits on people from prison. Like he's Ugh. claiming that the mob is after him. Like this man's delusions of grandeur were off the chart. I'm sure he would have offered to do a paternity test. And then when the paternity test inevitably came back positive, he probably would have found a way to say that that was, that was the system that he was, oh, there was a conspiracy sure. against him. Like of when you course. get into the like compulsive lying and shit like that, it's like, he doesn't fear being caught in the lie. He'll just make up six lies to cover it. Great call. In his own mind. Yeah. It's also interesting, just, just again, adding for a second, adding in again to um, this profile I'm building. Brenda spoke about how in their marriage, he was consumed by all women. And I thought consumed was a really interesting choice of phrasing. Oh, yeah. Because again, it feels like he has these conflicted feelings where it's like he hates them, but he's obsessed with them. He wants their approval. He wants to be a big man, to have sex with them, to feel like a man, whatever, et cetera. But he also can't stand them. You know? And there's there's different kinds of women. He views different women differently. If you're my wife, then you have to stay home and not talk to anybody and I control you. But if you're my girlfriend, there's a different set of rules. Interesting. Potentially. Sure. You know, and I also think the other detail that I would add that 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 stuck out to me in terms of this is the detail that I believe you said that Brenda said he was physically abusive with her once in the first year of the marriage and that it was his father Yep. That told him to, to smarten up. Correct. That's interesting to me, too, that he still as an adult man, I know he was a young adult, but but still as a as a as a man. Listened to and deferred to his father in that context. Yeah. Again, the fact that he would have that much respect for a man, but not for a woman. All of this is just fascinating. I mean, again, the like the anger towards women. I've been watching a lot of SVU uh, recently. Oh, sure. Um, but the anger towards women, it is miraculous to me that he didn't commit more violent sex crimes. That being said, it makes complete sense to me that he's going after the youngest women possible, the women oh. who are the easiest to manipulate, to groom, to control, all of those things. He obviously you know, didn't have an interest in women his own age because that would have become more difficult for him. Sure. Um, again, because also, as we know, sex crimes are about power and control and rarely about the actual sex. It feels like by choosing those partners, those children, that is an extension of the want for control. Um, the reveal 15 months after Linda's death, he married Patty. I think that was one of probably my biggest re reactions we've ever had on this show. Cause I just, yeah. I didn't see it coming to be honest, even with all of the kind of like foreshadowing. Um, David Brown is, a, is absolute trash side note. That just made me laugh. Um, this whole thing does feel like such a tragedy. Oh yeah. The cinnamon in this story to me Look, even if she did pull that trigger, even if she did kill Linda, the life that she had been living in that house, the, the way that she was being treated, the fact that her own father would have asked her to do this and then asked her to take the heat for it and stay in prison. It's just so sad. I mean, obviously, the biggest tragedy of all is, of course, Linda's loss of life. Make no mistake, I'm not suggesting that sure that that is is not as tragic. That is, of course, the headline period, full stop. I think it just also is a tragedy to these other young women involved. I think it's a tragedy to Patty. I think it's a tragedy to cinnamon that this man was wreaking havoc 
in so many people's lives. And and again, yeah. costing costing Linda's life at the hands of potentially her own sister slash stepdaughter. Dark, man. Really dark. And also not not a story we typically hear. Right? Oh, he yeah. destroyed so many lives. So especially many lives. of all like mostly females. Yeah. Well, and that I was mean, his that was his prerogative. Oh, for sure. Like Linda, yeah. Linda's mother, Linda's sister, his own daughter, all I would say all three of his daughters. I just I could never imagine telling one of my children they have to go live outside be because I'm just like, no, sorry, it's not going to work. told her to shoot herself in the head after the crime. Don't kill yourself, but just grade yourself. Then gave her a bottle of pills and told her to take that? I mean, that's a level of, of twistedness that, yeah, that's I, I feel for Cinnamon. That is a, an absolute mindfuck. And this person that she is reliant upon for survival is is saying you have to do this and and here's how you're going to do it etc that is that is just so dark the idea too you raise a great point about like she didn't have a key to the house and he was locking and setting an alarm yep every night so this child i'm assuming there wasn't a bathroom in that trailer maybe there was but it doesn't sound like she was like if she had to go to the bathroom the night does she just have to go outside like this is and also, like, what messaging does that send her brain that he's so uh, protective of his wife and Patty and Crystal that he's putting this elaborate alarm on that building? Yep. But he is so ambivalent towards Cinnamon. She's in a in a trailer where she could have gotten snatched from. She wasn't protected. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can only hope that she's had a much better life since. I hope so. I really hope so. Just surrounded by people in love. Ugh. What a tragedy. And But what a fascinating story. Again, it's oh, not yeah. a typical one. You hear, obviously, the stories of someone convincing a new lover to kill sure. their partner so they can be together. Oh, sure. But it's rare to hear about a father manipulating a daughter to kill his wife. Yeah. What a piece of trash. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I can't even imagine what it was like for his younger two children to grow up. Yep. I just... It's also for me the fact that he, like, Cinnamon kind of was like back and forth between her parents. And then, like, the time she was with him, he would like threaten, of like, well, I guess you got to go live with your mother and like constantly pushing her away. And then being like, well, if, if Linda doesn't die, I have to leave, I have to leave you and I have to go away. And then it's like, just what he put her through. Just what a piece of shit. Yeah. What a piece of shit. Absolutely. Oh, gross. <laughs> On that <laughs> note, <laughs> Christy Oxborough, fantastic work as always. I was riveted. Your storytelling skills are impeccable. 12 out of 10, A++. We don't deserve you. Oh, no. I. Uh, it's, it's a damn honor. And I especially love Anything that uh, lets me yell at a man. Oh, listen, same. <laughs> and we thank you, dear listeners, for coming with us on this wild ride of an episode. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. Uh, if you'd like some bonus episodes, go over to patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails to learn more about our subscription-based service over there. And of course, the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out as well if you're interested. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next True Crime and Cocktails, lover, stalker, killer. 
My oh my, this is wild. Um, is that the documentary on Netflix? Yeah, it came out like February or so. I yes, the well, people like a the people like a doc. So I'm like, let's go new. What's up, doc? <laughs> that wasn't necessary at all. Oh, I beg to differ. I, Not even close. I think it was, and I enjoyed it. Well, listen, uh, <laughs> I look forward to that. I haven't watched that one yet. Maybe I will in preparation, or maybe oh. I'll let it be a surprise. We'll see. Um, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Ryan Paling. Good night, Marsha Clark. <laughs>